During the first three years of RuneScape's existence, the magic skill was considered an expensive skill. Runes were hard to come by in large quantities, but that's what magic required. While small amounts of runes could be bought from stores or received as monster drops, you'd need a lot more than just those to train your magic to any respectable level. This made the release of RuneCrafting on March 29, 2004 a real game-changer for RuneScape. The lower level of runes like Air, Mind and Water suddenly became widely available to everyone. Larger quantities of these runes became much cheaper very quickly, making magic much more accessible. However, the high level of runes were still scarce. Keep in mind the average player around this time was still quite young, so very few people were willing to spend their precious computer time running back and forth between banks and altars to train the skill. Even worse, since each essence only gave you a single rune at the early levels, you were getting both bad XP and bad money. Heck, more often than not, you'd be spending more on the essence than you'd get from selling the resulting runes. But some players stood their ground in the grind, and as soon as the high level runes opened up to them, alongside the ability to get multiple runes per essence, they gained access to an untouched market in a game that was slowly becoming one of the world's most successful MMOs. And with some smart decisions and access to thousands of extremely expensive runes, one player in particular would stand out from the crowd and build themselves the largest cartel RuneScape's ever seen, etching their name in history as one of the most successful skillers of all time. This is the story of Larrier. The beginning of the runecrafting race was an interesting one, but also a slow one, as the skill was designed to be incredibly sluggish. The player Troppermad was in the lead on the high scores for the first few days, tightly followed by players like Kale Still, the herblore legend Halvgnon, and eventually Zesima, who started the race a few weeks later, going from level 1 to 63 runecrafting and claiming first place on the high scores in just 3 days. Most people didn't care about the race. Keep in mind this huge skill release was accompanied by a teeny tiny update you might know as RuneScape 2. The players were busy exploring the new improved game, and new member after new member was arriving on Tutorial Island, seeking the adventure of a lifetime that the game promised them, and it surely delivered. Killing monsters, doing quests, mining tin and copper, it was easy to get sucked into the game back in the day. But just like real life, making money was hard for all the young players in 2004. So when someone appeared promising vast amounts of gold, you'd be hard pressed finding someone not biting their hand off. Come one, come all, yes you in the back! Come work for Laria! The high level player with a party hat would say, And you'll receive 100k coins per hour. A bargain. It might not have been the best moneymaker back in the day, but for any low level player, 100k was a gold mine. Heck, even a high level player would consider it. The party hat donning player would give some simple instructions. Meet by the nature altar in Karamja. Receive 25 noted essence and find a way to unnote them. Every time you return with 25 unnoted essence, you will receive another 25 noted essence, as well as your payment of 10,525 GP per trip, which would round up to about 100k per hour. A simple task. Several players would show up to do the job, arriving at the nature altar, where queues of people would be waiting for you to hand them their runes. But at all costs, do not enter the altar unless instructed to do so. Along the queue, there'd be party-headed guards waiting along the line, deciding who could enter. And if you were lucky enough to do so, you'd meet the mystery player by the altar, throwing her hands into the air to combine a set of nature runes. Trade quickly, if you're too slow you won't get a second chance. Then back out and repeat. Larrier no doubt appeared as a powerful player, and she absolutely was. But her empire started slowly, with a combination of organized adult players and a whole lot of money. When the race for the top of the high score started getting tight, the competitive players started looking for ways to improve their XP rates per hour. Well, it wasn't hard to see where the bottleneck was. The reason runecrafting was so slow was because it could take minutes at a time restocking at a bank and getting back to the altar. 
But if you had another player running with you who gave you their inventory of essence, well, you've just doubled your XP rates. But why stop at just one other person? What if you never had to bank yourself and focus solely on crafting runes? On May 15, 2004, Larrier sat in a comfortable third place on the runecrafting high score with level 75, and that's when she hired her first runner. Together, they'd run back and forth for a while, with Larrier paying the appropriate money for the work. But as XP built up, runes did too. And eventually, unlocking double nature runes per essence yielded not only a good amount of runes, but also money. Nature runes were still quite expensive, going for 325 GP per rune, meaning the profit was rolling in. One runner eventually became two. Two became four. Four became eight. On July 5th, Larrier passed half Gnan and went up to second place on the high scores with level 83, and was catching up to the top spot, still held by the player Kale Still. Over the summer, Larrier was directly behind him in the XP race, but Kale was also hiring runners to do the dirty work. On September 15, 2004, Kale Still became the first person ever to achieve 99 runecrafting, and promptly stopped all operations. Larrier also achieved 99 runecrafting on September 23rd, overcoming Kale and taking control of the crown on the top of the runecrafting high scores. The only difference between her and Kale was that Larrier had no intention of stopping. While the competition to 99 runecrafting was fierce, there were very few who were mad enough to continue competing past it. So with most of her competition dropping off once they got the skill cape, Larrier's business quickly became the most reliable operation for runners looking to make some quick gold. There was no shortage of willing players wanting to run essence for their mighty runecrafting queen. So the business kept growing. And growing. In fact, it was growing too big. Larrier was no longer able to keep control of the number of runners all by herself. The piles at the altar grew so large that people would complain about the weight. And then there's those acting in bad faith. From those pretending to be runners so they could scam her out of her runes, to those pretending to be her to make some quick money out of the dedicated runners. Larrier needed help. And so, together with her close friends, they set to work. And shaped the first and largest player-made business the game had ever seen. Welcome to Laria's runecrafting business. Would you like to be a runner? Across the game world, a group of recruiters would run around and hire players to join Laria's team. They'd make sure to find players that were looking for money and had some time on their hands to help run the essence. The player would be sent to a trainer, a player dedicated to teaching the player how to work for Laria. The business had some strict rules, not only to do with speed and precision, but also to follow the runescape rules at all time. If you broke any of the rules, you're out. Once the player had been fully trained, they became a runner, the lowest tier on the Larrier hierarchy, tasked with a noting essence in the closest bank and then returning to the nature altar. A collector would receive the unnoted essence and in return hand the runner 25 noted essence and 10,525 coins as payment. They would then get into the long queue leading up to the altar and wait for their turn to enter. Along the queue, there'd be the security. Players who were trusted by Larrier herself, tasked to keep order in the queue, and that only people hired to join the business would receive rune essence from the runners. If there were any problems, it was security's job to hop worlds and find a new world to continue the business, and inform the team members of their new place of operations, alongside reminding them to turn private chat off to prevent being followed. Further up the hierarchy, there'd be the managers. Acting like the boss on the site, their job was to make sure everything ran smoothly, to see to it that roles that needed doing were getting done, and make the hard decisions if someone had to get fired. Needed a trainer, the manager will find someone. A runner out of bounds, the manager will talk to them. Almost at the top, there's the CEO. Kind of a conflicting name, seeing Larrier herself wasn't the CEO in this situation. The group of CEOs would be at the very top of the hierarchy. The inner circle, if you will. The originators and Larrier's closest friends. They'd receive the massive quantities of nature runes and were tasked with selling them in Varrock or Falador, maybe even making forum threads on the official runescape forums to sell them all. The money would then be split across the ocean of workers, who consistently would get 100k GP per hour, speaking volumes to the massive amount of money they made. Now, I know what you're thinking. This sounds ridiculous. There's no way something like this would work. But despite all odds, the system worked. The business was incredibly successful. In fact, Larry was quickly becoming one of the most influential players in all of RuneScape.
What? Hurry up already. We don't have all day. I'm trying, but it tells me the altar can't be accessed in my world. If only there was an app that let me see things I can't access in my current location. Have you tried turning on NordVPN? What? With NordVPN, you get access to over 5,100 servers in 60 countries. It's never been easier to get access to Netflix shows, news articles, or even games you usually wouldn't be able to see in your home country. The nature altar over there is a metaphor for all that. Oh yeah, I've heard of Nord. I was considering getting it to help protect against DDoSing, but I don't know if I can be bothered setting it up on my laptop, phone, computer, cat, Nintendo Switch, PlayStation... You get the idea. Oh, yeah, that's a huge pain. If you want to install it like a peasant... <laughs> if you want to be cool, you can actually install NordVPN directly to your router. Its always-on features make sure anything connected to your internet hotspot is protected, and anyone at home can enjoy its benefits. It means your entire family, friends visiting, and creepy guys standing outside your window can surf the web completely secure and enjoy the content they want, no matter where you're from. Here, try activating it. Wow! Thanks, NordVPN! No problem. Go to nordvpn.com forward slash rswill for the Cyber Month deal and get yourself a two-year plan with one additional month on a huge discount. Make sure not to miss it, with Will Miss It. See you around, Timmy. My name's Carl. Uh, he's gone. All right, you missed your turn. Go to the back of the queue. What? As Larrier's business kept growing, so did the community. At one point, the queue of the collectors would stretch all the way from the nature altar to the general store. Hundreds of players were hired by the runecrafting queen, all looking to make money. Over the following months, Larrier increased her XP rates from 150,000 XP per day to 250,000, where efficient players running by themselves would at best see 128,000 XP in the same time. By November 26th, two months after achieving level 99, she amassed more than double the XP of second place on the high scores, with only three players having 99 runecrafting at that time. Larrier also made herself untouchable by adding an exclusivity rule to her business. If you ran for her, you couldn't run for anyone else. Even if other runecrafters could afford one or two runners, they'd never be able to match Larrier's personal juggernaut. Purely to flex, Larrier bought party hats for all members of her management. By 2004, party hats were already rare items, no longer obtainable in-game, so their status as a symbol of power was already well known, especially since they weren't cheap. On October 1st, 2005, Larrier finally passed 100 million runecrafting XP, which was almost five times larger than second place's paltry 22 million, and there were still only 17 players who had breached 13 million XP and hit 99 at this point. So to say Larrier was untouchable was an understatement. While Larrier's business was strict, and there was now an incredible number of players involved in it, you might be surprised to learn that the community fostered by it was very warm and welcoming. Older players would assist younger ones, friendships were formed, and everyone seemed to be having a really good time with it all. The people you ran with weren't your co-workers, they were your family. Working for Larrier wasn't just a way to make a quick buck anymore, it was seen as a great privilege and honor. This kind of wording was used a lot by the runners in-game, but most of those chat logs have been lost to the annals of history. The only real documentation we have to exemplify the feelings of the time are from archived forum posts, and what better way to show that off than erudites needed to lead the world? A recruitment post penned by none other than Larrier herself. From RuneScape's oldest temples deep in the depths of the jungle, forged forth the breath of a new civilization. Look around you in the game and you will see everywhere our youth, our future generations, molding their thoughts here. We have created here what may never be recreated in RuneScape again, something you can only experience, camaraderie beyond words. We are role models encouraging a good team spirit, high standards, and an honorable code of ethics throughout all aspects of life. I'm the number one rune crafter. Outside of my one high skill, I'm just an average player like yourself. Our rune crafting is here to help players generate fast cash at their convenience, and that is where our adventure begins. You will be a role model to the younger members of our community, starting out as a runner, and many are promoted to numerous jobs in our team. No hassles and countless hours of lost time in getting essence or selling natures. 
just honest cash available. As Christmas 2005 approached, the team made a post to the RuneScape forums asking for the employees to allow Larry to take some time off for the holidays, as if they were the ones in control, appealing to the camaraderie between the ranks. The posts paint Larry as some sort of saintly figure, as if she was crafting runes out of the kindness of her heart, rather than just paying people to get the best XP in the game. All good things must come to an end, however, and late 2006 is where Larry left for greener pastures. Her son asked her to move to a new and exciting game called EverQuest 2, and what sort of mother would turn down a request from her own flesh and blood? At the time of her departure, Larry still dominated the high scores with 157 million XP, five times that of second place. Reportedly, her account was banned for about a day after she left, likely due to security concerns over her high-profile account. The managers and CEOs of the business attempted to keep it going after she left, but as they had spent the past two years helping someone else train runecrafting, none of them had actually trained it up themselves. And since no one could craft double nature runes, the business ran at a net loss and quickly ran out of money entirely. Some of the managers tried to persuade Larry to keep going and hit the experience cap at 200 million, but she was dead set on moving on. Larry briefly returned to the game prior to the removal of free trade in late 2007, so that she could donate all of her remaining wealth to the CEOs of the business, who then divvied it up between all the remaining team members. And with that final paycheck, Larry's runecrafting cartel disbanded for good. The runecrafting queen will forever be remembered in the RuneScape history books as one of the most innovative and successful skillers in the game. It took a whole three years in the release of a faster runecrafting method for any player to even get close to her on the high scores, when Phoenix Odin eventually surpassed her in late 2009 and went on to be the first player with 200 million runecrafting XP. Larry's legacy as a runecrafting legend was honored by the RuneScape developers on April 4th, 2011, when Mod Ash added the NPC Larrier to the runecrafting guild, replacing Aubrey as the NPC that sold the runecrafting cape to any player who hit 99. And that's it for this one. This story has quickly become one of my favorite ones so far. Just knowing that someone was able to pull this off in a game like RuneScape, without proper platforms to plan this on, all while relying on mostly children who are known for being wild and unruly, it's a seriously impressive feat. Let me know what you all thought about the story in the comment section below. If you were a runner back in the days, I'd especially love to hear from you. My name is Will Missit, and I'll see you all later.